and director of the her program, program on U.S.-Russian relations, of which this talk and our guest today is a part. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to host Michael Kimmich, who will be discussing his new book, The Origins of the War in Ukraine and the New Global Instability. I should have said collisions first. This is the short title. That works. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just uh, talk a little bit about format before we get started. I'll introduce our speaker, and um, and then we'll we'll jump in. Um, so the format today will be um, a little more relaxed. We will have a shorter presentation of about fifteen minutes, and then we will move to questions from the audience. And um, we want to hear from you, so you are welcome to introduce yourself and then pose your question. Um, and um, we'll go from there. Uh, for the, our guests at home who are, or wherever you may be, we are live streaming this and you are welcome to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, and we will, we will also take questions from, from our virtual audience. Um, so welcome to everyone in person and virtually. And um, I'm, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce um, our speaker. Michael Kimmage is a professor of history at the Catholic University of America and non-resident senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. From 2014 to 2016, he served on the Secretary's Policy Planning Staff at the U.S. State Department. He is the author of The Conservative Turn, Lionel Trilling, Whitaker Chambers, and The Lessons of Anti-Communism, published by Harvard University Press in 2009 and The Abandonment of the West, The History of an Idea in American Foreign Policy, published by Basic Books in 2020. He writes regularly on international affairs for foreign affairs um, and has been quite active in publishing in foreign affairs since this crisis um, and this war. And he is also the chair of the advisory council of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. Um, and I guess I should mention that um, I would, first of all, like to thank the organizers of Leo, our persistent. And Leo, the book is for sale, correct? Okay, so just I should mention that at the outset. It's on sale right here um, at the end of the talk. And I'd also like to thank Eileen for helping to organize our talk today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Kimmich. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you so much to the Harriman Institute for the invitation uh, to come, and it's 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 great to have the chance to share with you uh, the basic outline of the book, uh, which I'll try to do as briefly as possible, uh, and then to go quickly into uh, some discussions and 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 conversation. I, I don't think on this subject there's going to be a, a shortage of questions and uh, a shortage of what to discuss. It's been a special pleasure to be, in a sense, back here at Columbia University. For me, I was here for my fourth year of graduate school, but over at the Butler Library in the Rare Books and Manuscripts Division, researching the the archive of the Lionel Trilling archive there. And I don't recall ever coming over to SIPA. I remember walking past this, this imposing building, uh, but I don't think I ever uh, came inside. So it's it's wonderful, as it were, to come across campus uh, and uh, and to enter the gates of the, uh, of the Harriman Institute. So I'd like to offer three points about the setup of the book, uh, each of which flows from the title, which is a plural noun, uh, collisions, and explain why it's not collision, but a, a noun in the plural. Uh, and then from there, I'd like to go to the four points that I raised by way of conclusion, and enough time has passed. I think I remember it quite well. I think the book reached the point of no return. You could sort of work on the details, but the content was set on the very day of the Prigozhin mutiny. Uh, I remember it well, uh, feeling like my conclusion might or might not hold up uh, over time. Uh, so it was you know, about 10 months ago that the book was finished. And I think I can, in a way, very briefly evaluate how the <laughs> concluding insights of the book hold up, some some better than others. But there are four concluding insights, and so I'll share those with you. Uh, and then we can go into a, uh, an open conversation. The reason I think Collisions is a necessary title or a necessary motif is that I don't think that the war, if we date it either to uh, 2014 or 2022, uh, is a war to be understood uh, as, as only one conflict. Right? I think it's a nested series of conflicts. In fact, there are three in my book, but you could 
probably introduce other layers uh, as well. Uh, and each of these conflicts has a different storyline, has a different chronology, has a different dynamic, has a different logic, and, and probably will have a different conclusion. Uh, so it may not be one war, it may in fact be multiple wars that we're observing over the last several years. Uh, and most centrally, most obviously, most directly, this is a war uh, waged by Russia against uh, Ukraine. So the Russia-Ukraine context is uh, is uh, front and center uh, with, uh, with this conflict. Uh, and the Russia-Ukraine story uh, can be told as a story of the last 10 years, uh, but to be sure there are hundreds of years of history uh, behind it, some of which are put to use rhetorically uh, in the Kremlin for certain purposes, uh, and some of which have a bearing on the geography of the conflict, uh, and some of which have a bearing on both Ukrainian and Russian uh, motivations uh, for uh, for continuing the war and for uh, and for not ending it. So obviously, this is uh, this is that war. Secondly, I think almost as obviously, this is a Russia-Europe war. Uh, it's not as if Europe is distant from the conflict as we speak. Obviously, Europe is central as as uh, uh, as a complex of countries that's providing military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, and if we're to begin the story anywhere, it's hard to know always where to begin. Uh, as a historian, a decent point of departure would be the decision of the European Union in 2009 to initiate something called the Eastern Partnership Program which was related not just to Ukraine, but uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia. Uh, and uh, it's um, improbable in some ways when you think yourself back to 2009, to the beginning of this program, which was legalistic and bureaucratic and in many ways very unspectacular, uh, that from it uh, such uh, a, a long thread of conflict could uh, emerge. It was not the intention of the European Union at all to involve itself in anything resembling a war. In fact, the impossibility of war was a precondition for this program uh, in the first place. Uh, and it's a rather accidental chain of events that leads from 2009 uh, to 2013, which I don't think I should review in detail, but uh, it's the decision that fell on the shoulders of Viktor Yanukovych, president of Ukraine from 2000 to uh, 2010 to early 2014, he had to decide whether to sign an association agreement with the European Union, which he may have wanted to do, probably didn't, who knows, he went back and forth, he tried to you know, postpone not making a decision, uh, and at a certain point he had to decide, there was quite a bit of Russian pressure on him not to sign the association agreement, and even the very final hours when we went to Vilnius, where there was the sort of summit meeting about this, um, he may have not fully made up his mind. Uh, but when he did, when he refused to sign the association agreement, that sparked a revolution uh, in Ukraine, not immediately, but over the course of a couple of weeks. And when that revolution culminated in the flight of Viktor Yanukovych on the late evening hours of February 21st, 2014, or early morning hours of February 22nd, when he fled first uh, to Eastern Ukraine and then to, to Crimea and then to Russia, very quickly, almost immediately after that, you have the Russian annexation uh, of uh, of Crimea, the first phase really of war, followed by Russia's incursion into eastern Ukraine, uh, or the Donbas, which is the first you know sort of iteration of this war. Europe is maybe not that central an actor; it's a diplomatic actor between 2015 and 2022, uh, but it's been central to the war. Europe figures, you know, very largely, obviously, in Russian strategic thinking about the war. Uh, which is very much about the European security order. Uh, and Europe figures very prominently in Ukraine's aspiration to travel uh, in a westward direction uh, and to use the war uh, as uh, a stepping stone for entrance into the European Union uh, and into the NATO alliance. So you can't abstract Europe from this conflict. It wouldn't make any sense without, uh, it would make no sense without Europe uh, and the Russia-Europe uh, conflict also has centuries of history uh, behind it, certainly. Third, uh, you know, kind of brings the story home in a way, is the U.S.-Russia component to this conflict. Let's shift over just for a second to the Russian side, uh, to the degree that official rhetoric is a guide to strategic thinking in the Kremlin, which it, which it is up to a point. Uh, the United States looms very large uh, in this conflict. It's as if 
Ukraine itself is a kind of shell. Behind that is the European shell. And behind these two shells is the real thing, the United States. That's the implication uh, of a lot of Putin speech making and a lot of official rhetoric uh, in, in Russia, the collective West, but the United States is the sort of engine uh, of the collective West. Uh, and in particular, the military ties between Ukraine and the United States after 2014 uh, are, I think, a very significant factor in Russia's decision to wage war as it did in 2022. Uh, and, you know, for any kind of settlement, any negotiation, the United States is going to be an important uh, player. Uh, and the U.S.-Russian component is what makes this war not quite a regional war, maybe not quite a world war either, a, world war, a war with many global dimensions, but crucially a war with a nuclear dimension. Not that nuclear weapons have so far been used, but that's the potential on both sides. And that's, of course, uh, one of the most uh, important aspects of this particular conflict that we are collectively where we never quite were during the Cold War uh, on uh, the edge uh, of, uh, of a very direct form of conflict between Russia uh, and the United States. The United States has been until recently the key military uh, uh, source of uh, key military source of aid to Ukraine uh, and a very important actor across Europe and the region, a kind of linchpin of global diplomacy when it comes to sanctions and to other uh, aspects uh, of the global war uh, or the wars uh, kind of global context, the United States has been uh, a central player. Even, one might say, in its absence, so the last six months, the U.S. hasn't been providing military assistance to Ukraine, but even the absence of the U.S. is itself a pretty important factor uh, on the battlefields of Ukraine. It's an important factor in Ukraine's military calculations and an important factor in Europe's military calculations. And to be sure, whether the U.S. is sort of in or out of the war is a very important factor uh, for Moscow's military Population. So these are three conflicts that fold into each other rather, you know, sort of incompletely. They kind of overlap, but uh, it's enough to disentangle these three threads. But I will offer to the ambitious graduate students among us the appeal to think even more globally than this about this conflict and to look into the Middle East dimensions, which are highly important. Obviously, the Russia China piece is a pivotal part of the puzzle. And then when it comes to inflation, food security, and many other issues, the war is already having a kind of reconfiguring uh, uh, impact uh, on uh, on the global situation, which is why I sort of dangled that in the title, uh, "The Origins of the War and the New Global Instability," because the global part is 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 key as well. So, you know, people who will take this uh, this subject analytically further than I was able to do, I think, will do so by making it uh, more of a global narrative uh, and less of a kind of U.S. Russia. Uh, Russia, Europe, Russia, Ukraine narrative. So what were the four concluding insights that I had uh, in this book? They're sort of in the guise of predictions, which is a risky thing to do, uh, but um, the temptation is too great not to do it. And if we're to speculate on policy choices, uh, which I'm happy to do when we have the chance to go back and forth, you can't really do that without making certain predictions. Let's call them working predictions from what we know at the present moment or what I knew uh, roughly a year ago. Uh, when when writing the conclusion. First conclusion, I think I will stand by with a high degree of confidence uh, and that this war marks a profound break between Russia and the West, understood as Europe and the United States, or can make it a little bit broader than that, uh, in ways that to me seem uh, almost without precedent or example uh, in recent Russian history. And by recent, I mean Russian history going back to the figure of Peter the Great. Uh, that what Putin has done with this war, and I don't think that it's an opportunity cost of the war, I think it's part of its strategic purpose for Putin, uh, is to build a Russia that is, yes, anti-Western in some ways, but more importantly, sort of non-Western, independent of the West, able to be autonomous to this degree, uh, and to restructure the Russian economy in this way, uh, to restructure Russia's web of relationships, partnerships, I don't know if Russia really has alliances exactly, but uh, edge in that direction with uh, with China and a few other powers. Uh, and, you know, let the cultural chips fall where they may, perhaps, it's sort of hard to know how the Kremlin could engineer Russia's cultural break from the West, but I suspect that that will happen as a consequence of these other shifts. If you're 18 years old now in Russia, how much would you invest in learning English and, and these kinds of things? You might do it because it's a global language and there are a lot of books you can read in English, but your chances of studying in the US or Europe are almost non-existent, doing business, you know, sort of travel, even friendships, uh, and these things are gonna be difficult to manage over the wall uh, 
that Putin has put up with this war. Uh, and so I think that the rupture is going to be, is already uh, very considerable and it's going to become quite a bit more considerable uh, in the future. It's going to be, even if you would get a pro-Western leader after Putin, very difficult to overcome the conditions that the war has implanted uh, in Russia. Speaking in policy terms, what Russia would have to do to normalize relations with the West would be to withdraw all of its soldiers from Ukrainian territory, pay reparations to Ukraine, and send thousands upon thousands of Russians to the uh, to the Hague. The likelihood of that happening uh, is, of course, extremely small. And if that doesn't happen, to overcome the gulf that's now there between Russia and the West is going to be uh, severely difficult. So that's one prediction that doesn't seem to me less true a year ago, if anything, uh, more true today than it was uh, a year ago. Secondly, I predict in the conclusions of the book that Ukraine will join the West. Uh, and I don't know if I'm that specific in the book about how. Uh, I've never been that convinced that NATO or perhaps even the European Union are going to be the vehicles. There are lots of good arguments uh, in favor of that, uh, but I'm not sure that the political will is there uh, in the case of NATO in the US and a handful of other countries. And the European Union, I think, the political will may be there, but it's going to be a very slow process. But those are not the only two benchmarks or measurements. There's sensibility. Uh, and Ukraine has already, uh, I think, become European uh, on that level. Uh, there's the back and forth of populations that's uh, happening. Uh, and there's political aspiration. I think that's there in different ways in Eastern and Central Europe and Western Europe and in Ukraine itself to build up uh, structures of affiliation which may not at the, for the foreseeable future be the EU and NATO, uh, but will incline in that direction. Uh, I think that that's still uh, true. A lot depends, of course, on the outcome of the war itself uh, in terms of this project, but I think that the motivation is very much there still uh, in Ukraine, maybe a little bit less in Europe than I would have uh, sort of anticipated a year ago, uh, but it's powerful in Europe uh, as well. My third prediction, I think has been the weakest of the three or the most questionable of the three. And this is that a little bit like the First World War, the Second World War, the early phases of the Cold War, that this conflict was going to draw the United States back into a highly sustained engagement with Europe. 1917 uh, is the transition year. 1916, Woodrow Wilson campaigns on not fighting the First World War on the part of the US, and then the US gets pulled in or he pulls the US into the First World War. You have two years where FDR is kind of negotiating that uh, decision. Pearl Harbor resolves the question for FDR. Uh, and then the Cold War, again, you know, justifies a very uh, extended set of uh, aspirations and involvements that the U.S. has. Uh, in Western Europe, these have receded prior to 2022. And there's the back and forth of domestic American politics. So it's not a given. We'll go back to the pivot, uh, pivot to Asia. Uh, that The Obama administration declared for its uh, foreign policy. And I had thought a year ago that this was definitively repurposed or refashioned by the war in Ukraine. There are enough U.S. interests there that concern Ukraine and Europe at large. There's the highest degree sort of, of financial support for Ukraine was coming from the United States. And when it came to targeting intelligence, provision of military aid, the U.S. was once again sort of at the top of the list. When it comes to refugees and other kinds of assistance to, to, assistance to Ukraine, you can see that Europe has done in many cases more uh, than the US. But on the military side, the US was in the forefront. I don't think I could have predicted what happened to unfold, uh, one of the many strange contingencies of this conflict, it's the sort of thin margin of victory that the Republican Party had in the midterm elections, the rules that they set up with the Speaker of the House uh, and a fairly small group of Republicans who, uh, it's not so much I think have a vested interest in any one policy toward Ukraine, but are gonna do the bidding uh, of candidate Trump, who in my estimation just wants to create problems for Biden instead of make him look bad. I don't think that Ukraine is uh, of great concern to candidate Trump. And so you have for the last six months, the refusal of the House of Representatives to bring to the floor uh, the bill that could enable the $60 billion in aid that the House would certainly support, the Senate would support, uh, and the White House would support. That's something I couldn't have predicted. That's a kind of accident in some ways, uh, but there we are. Uh, and, you know, unless Biden is reelected with Republicans losing the House, I think Republicans could win the Senate and probably it wouldn't make too much difference. But in a sense, I think for the aid to go through, unless Speaker Johnson pulls a rabbit out of a hat, uh, 
you need a certain outcome to the 2024 uh, election. So that means that the U.S. policy has become, uh, you know, more episodic, more relative, uh, more contingent, less dependable, less uh, predictable. Whether that's the will of the American electorate, the kind of will of the country at large, well, we can speculate about that, but that's the sort of, that's the, what's the what the American political system has uh, delivered at the present. Finally, and I'll conclude on this note, uh, because it's a point that I try myself to internalize, I think, unsuccessfully. Uh, and this is the prediction that Europe is going to be a cognate not for peace, as it was after 1991, but a cognate for war for years, if not for decades uh, to come. This is especially difficult for somebody of I don't know, my generation, if I can speak in those terms, uh, to accept graduating from college in 1995 with the strong sense that all the borders were falling and the walls were uh, disappearing uh, and integration was the law of the land and that Europe was sort of leading the way in this regard uh, and going where the rest of us uh, would follow. Easy to look back on that and say it was naive and, you know, sort of hopelessly idealistic, but I think that was very much the conventional wisdom uh, of the 1990s. And I think that that conventional wisdom lingered on until the early morning hours of February 24th, 2022. Uh, and it defies reality in some ways because the annexation of Crimea and Russian invasion of Eastern Ukraine was very much a war. What else, can you, how else can you describe it? Uh, and you have conflicts prior to that, the Russia-Georgia war and, and, uh, and Yugoslavia, et cetera. But still the scale and magnitude of 2022 is what it is. And it means that this war is there uh, at the very heart of Europe. Uh, I don't see any way in which this war can be unwound uh, in the next a uh, couple of years. Uh, there are ways in which the war uh, could spread, certainly. Uh, and uh, I do think that it will define in many ways what Europe is. Europe is much more than this particular war. It's not the only thing that will define uh, what Europe is, but it will define what Europe is. That demands, I think, of us all a major cognitive shift, a sort of shift in uh, understanding that I think we're only at the uh, at the beginning of. So I'll conclude on that uh, on that note, that's something I write about in the in the in the conclusions of the book, and and, and I'll stand by that point <laughs> this evening here in uh, uh, in April of 2024 uh, in, in in New York City. Okay, thank you. Some um, very light and uh, <laughs> I think it's interesting. There's, there's a lot to think about here, a lot to uh, talk about. And so uh, I want to I want to open it up to the floor, but let me just make the point that for a book that covers so much um, ground historically, analytically, and um, in terms of the substantive, substantive predictions, it's written in in a way that um, is really uh, impressive and makes it highly readable. Because on the one hand, you're engaged with these deep and uh, meaningful arguments and and points, but you also have a kind of way of of succinctly capturing the essence of something with just a few words or a few sentences, uh, which I admire, and I had to get out my highlighter. And, um, you know, for example, just the way you described Yanukovych and how he differs from Putin, and I just thought this really captures in, you know, in a matter of, a, of one or two sentences, the, the kind of essence of, of his rule and, and of, of, the, of the person himself. Um, and, and same for the way you, you sort of discuss the the kind of supposed, you know, geopolitical um, orientation divide in Ukraine. That was also really skillful. So the book is filled. I haven't fit, finished the whole book, but, if, you know, if, if what I've read is indicative, it's a great read um, and, it, and it's written beautifully. So I, I'm going to encourage our audience members to um, take a look uh, or buy the book. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions and comments from the floor. Peter. Oh, and please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Peter Clement. I teach here as an adjunct and senior research scholar. I spent most of my life at CIA as a Russian analyst and who can advertise the public. And I know Nick Milovich, I'm assuming you know. Yes. Yes. yes, of course. So my question is, um, first, it's a great talk. Very analytic. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I can't say I disagree with a whole lot. I'm, I'm perplexed. I remain perplexed. In the period between 2014 and 2022, somewhere in that time frame, Putin made the final decision that he was going to do this unbelievable World War I-style invasion of his next door neighborhood. 
you have a sense from your reading of the chronology and, and, and your research, when do you think Putin finally got close to that decision? Was there a particular thing that triggered it? Or was it inevitable over time because we weren't getting anywhere with the MIPS process? I mean, there's probably a lot of factors, but you had to pick a particular point in time when you think he actually made the decision where he thought we're going. When do you think that it was? Well, that's a wonderful question. Let me back up just for a second when it comes to Putin's decision making, Kremlin decision making, since we are in an academic setting. We have no good evidence, period. Uh, on this on this subject, uh, we have Putin's speeches. We have his actions. Uh, we do have. It's not as if the Russian government doesn't release security documents and 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 strategies and such. But these are not really good blueprints uh, as to what's truly happening, or they seem not to be very good blueprints to what's truly happening. So everything written and discussed on this topic is speculation. Uh, and that's maybe self-evident, but I do think in an academic setting, when you speculate, you have to say that you're speculating. And when you're reviewing evidence, uh, it's a different kind of conversation. So it's pure speculation or inference, really. Uh, and so you do the best that you can do uh, in this regard. And so I'll sort of offer you the best that I can offer uh, in terms of this million dollar question about when Putin made up his mind to do this. And this is contested among many people who are deeply versed in the subject, some of whom say that Putin decided two weeks before the invasion itself uh, to do it, and others of whom would, you know, <laughs> year 1800, this was sort of inevitable because it's kind of in the, uh, in the DNA of all Russian policymakers, and so it's there from time immemorial. So that's the spectrum that you have from, from the moment of to, to, to centuries back into the past. Uh, it's clear that Putin gave himself the capacity to wage this war uh, in early 2021. So you have the first military buildup in 2021, uh, which is a trial balloon perhaps, or what seems a bit more plausible to me, a kind of conscious feint that you don't do it for the sake of making it less believable the second time around, uh, in a way, a kind of uh, a decoy activity. Uh, but still, he gives himself the chance to invade. There's no way that you could mount an invasion of this scale. You mentioned sort of World War, World War One scale uh, invasion, you can't do it in a couple of weeks. So the buildup is going to have to take months. Uh, and that first becomes uh, a possibility in early uh, 2021. Uh, I would put together just a few factors that seem to me generally significant uh, and how they affect the exact chronology. I wouldn't be able to begin to say, but uh, I'll offer them for your uh, consideration and not really in any hierarchy of, uh, of, uh, of importance. So Angela Merkel is leaving the scene. Uh, in 2021 to be replaced by somebody other than Angela Merkel. I think we've seen uh, that Europe is in fact quite a bit weaker. Germany is quite a bit weaker without Angela Merkel. There's a cottage industry in Washington, Washington DC and in sort of trashing Angela Merkel as the weakling of Europe. Um, I think we've forgotten the many ways in which she gave strength to Europe and a kind of cohesion to Europe, but you know, she's exiting the scene. So Europe uh, is going through a couple of leadership transitions 2020, 2021, but that's one of them. Now, the U.S. election opens many cans of worms in this regard. Would Putin have invaded had Trump been president? And so the question sort of commonly asked. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. All I can say is the manner of transition from election day in November till the 6th of January and beyond is, of course, without precedent in American history. We tend to think of its meaning for American politics, and that meaning is substantial but the international meaning is probably not less substantial. If Putin was speculating with this idea of invading or not invading, would that have made him more likely to invade? I'm sure it would have made him more likely to invade. After all, Putin for years before 2021 is speaking about dysfunction and polarization in American politics, and there you have a, a, a spectacular example of that. In Ukraine, you had the presidential election of 2019. So I think it's in April of 2019 that Zelensky becomes uh, the president uh, after after Poroshenko, and I think that there is a little bit of a honeymoon, probably from April to December. That's when Putin and Zelensky meet in Paris, and not much comes of that. You have a few episodes early 2021. You know the arrest of Medvedchuk, closing down of certain TV stations, where there seems to be a uh, a somewhat hardening position uh, in Ukraine. Um, Putin shows very little interest in following through after the first meeting. It's interrupted by the COVID pandemic. They were supposed to have met again in March, Zelensky and Putin. But Putin is really not 
sending any kind of conciliatory signals then. So he's making certain decisions probably in 2020. Uh, and then I think Zelensky takes things in a direction that Putin doesn't like, sort of sees personal affront uh, in some of Zelensky's uh, action. And then finally, the pullout from Afghanistan, this is too often to me a kind of party political point that Republicans latch on to in D.C. to sort of criticize Democrats, that it was the withdrawal in August of 2021 from Afghanistan that made up Putin's mind. I don't think it's that. I think it's Afghanistan as such, right? U.S. goes in in 2002 to root out the Taliban, and in 2020 and 2019 and 2021, the U.S. is negotiating with the Taliban uh, to leave the country. That's a pretty conspicuous defeat for the United States. If you map that onto Ukraine, what you get for Putin is a sense that, well, this is probably doable. At a certain point, the U.S. is going to lose interest. You know, if you make it a 5, 10, 15 year conflict, Russia will have advantages. The U.S. will have disadvantages. And I think all of this becomes a kind of confluence. And then very finally, I don't mean to go on too great length about this. Uh, Putin would not have invaded had he not believed his country to be strong, strong enough not just to invade, but to win. So I think he's making certain assessments of his own political position, Russian economy, state of the Russian military. That may have been based on faulty information, his assessment of the Russian military. But still, these kind of internal assessments in 2020, 2021 had to be pretty self-confident. So you merge all those things together, and I think you get Putin giving himself the option, probably by the time he writes the piece about Ukrainians and Russians being one people in the summer of 2021, the decision has been made. Why else would you go public with that kind of thing? Uh, in, in in the summer, if not uh, to, to pave the way to invasion. Thank you. Yes. Hi. My name is Charles Wagner. I'm a third year undergraduate student in the early Russian language and international relations. Thank you for coming today. I'm really excited to read the book. Uh, my question was you had mentioned this earlier about when you finished the book, and you, and you said it was on the day of the mutiny. I'm curious what you think, kind of from both a historical and analytical perspective, what um, the Wagner group and Prigozhin represent in the kind of timeline of the war and the intervene. Does, does the mutiny and kind of the Wagner's role in the invasion, does that feel significant to you, or is it kind of a, a, a blip in otherwise a much more significant conflict? Because I, I feel like there are very opinions on how important uh, his his participation in the conflict is relative to Putin's power and the strength of the Russian military and so on. Well, well thank you very much, Charlie, for the question. I'm embarrassed about the stuff I myself wrote about the provoking mutiny. Uh, you know, it's the vexing thing about the internet that. Uh, these things live forever, uh, and uh, a series of, of predictions about how this was rattling the Putin regime at the time or a sign that internecine strife was going to overtake the Kremlin, maybe slightly overstating the kinds of arguments I made after the Prigozhin mutiny, but I did make those kinds of arguments, and those were certainly wrong. Those were overstatements or overinterpretations of a very anarchic and, and chaotic day in, 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 in Russian politics. Um, so it wasn't 1917. Tsar Nicholas II was not about to get, you know, sort of locked in his car. Uh, the soldiers were not about to mutiny on that scale, and the revolution uh, was not about to come. Although, you know, you sort of go back in time and try to understand why you make those mistakes, and and uh, that would be um, an interesting intellectual endeavor. But it's not a meaningless event uh, by any means. So I think you can extract from it two points uh, that speak to the larger significance of this war. One of which has gotten very little attention, I think, because we don't really have journalists who can write this story, but this is the story of the front on the Russian side. So there are lots of policy experts, journalists, and others who are going to Ukraine uh, and writing that story. And you have lots of great journalists from many countries uh, who are telling the story of Ukrainian soldiers. And the New York Times runs about once a week, you know, really good uh, material on this, what it's like, what it's like for the families, you know, what it's like to be of the age that many Ukrainian soldiers are and, and uh, you know, the politics that's behind that. We know very little about the Russian front, very, very little. Uh, I know that on the Russian side, there are embedded journalists, uh, there are bloggers, you know, maybe if they're very gifted at reading between the lines, you can get information there. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a blank for us. Uh, uh, you know, I think if you live in Russia, probably you'll interact with people who maybe come back and you can have informal conversations and get a sense of how it's going. What the Prigozhin mutiny tells us is that life is really hard for a lot of Russian soldiers. And th that level of discontent doesn't come from nowhere. 
you know, the fact that you had all those soldiers kind of either doing nothing on the day of the mutiny, uh, or in some cases kind of joining with the uh, the mutiny, the kinds of critiques that Provosian himself was making very publicly on social media about insufficiency of shells and bad planning and, you know, all kinds of things that you can suspect are true. Uh, on the Russian side, I think that the Provosian mutiny showed us that there's really uh, very, very difficult circumstances. So especially in this moment where Russia is sort of uh, on the top of one of the sort of shifting arcs of the war and, and trying to make the most of it media-wise, we might want to remember what drove those soldiers to, to mutiny uh, a year ago. The second point I would make uh, about the Progosian, not because you asked about Wagner and Progosian uh, in general, all wars bring to all countries brutalization. That's the story of every war. Uh, it's not unique uh, to the Russian side. Uh, there are some ways in which the Russian government has abetted uh, the brutality of the war when thinks of you know, decorating the soldiers who were who were in Bucha as a as a kind of um, you know very you know explicit government decision to say something about the war in terms of its uh, of its brutality, but the fact that you have a kind of military plus paramilitary you know that itself is um, again not unique to Russia but conducive to uh, a very curious chain of command, uh, and you know that this is sort of tolerated. A figure like Prigozhin himself, who's sort of from the underworld. Uh, a long criminal past, having that degree of, poli of political prominence also speaks to uh, some kind of brutalization that's coming about through the war. So you can ask the question about Russia uh, with the war. Did Putin brutalize the society to make it ready for war? Does the war brutalize society in its course? You know, I don't quite know. These are entangled uh, narratives and storylines. But to me, when I think of Prigozhin, that's to me more the most of what he signals. Obviously, there's his activities in Africa economic ventures and, you know, meddling in the 2016 election, you can you can do all of that as well. But I think the brutality part of it and the coarseness of Prigozhin as a figure is just, uh, is just relevant. Okay, that's all. I'm Keith Desmond, a teacher of the journalism school. Um, great to see you. Um, we, we've, uh, we've corresponded about this, but I wanted to ask you about it in this context. Um, maybe more fully, but uh, the question of sort of how do we, you've been in this space for a while, um, and something that we've been thinking a lot about in journalistic circles and at the Herring Institute is how do we kind of rethink um, the region and Russia in the way of the original 1442, right? Um, we need to turn our paradigm upside down, we need to expand it. Um, how have you kind of changed your thinking and, and reconsidered some of your thinking before the war. So I've changed my thinking in 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 one sort of big way and, and maybe not entirely changed my thinking in another way. So I'll, I'll think about uh, about continuity. Um, we could go back and have a long conversation about the 1990s uh, and U.S. policy in the 1990s and, and where things went uh, went wrong. Uh, and I had believed before and continued to believe that U.S. policy, and I think Europe is sort of equally guilty, was too zero-sum. Not that the U.S. was out to get Russia ever. I don't think that that was really the case. Not that the U.S. was out to weaken Russia in the 1990s uh, economically, although uh, you could probably feel that way uh, in Russia, but the structures that were inherited from the early Cold War were, were were too inflexible, and it goes back to the point about NATO that we were speaking of a little bit uh, a little bit earlier about Ukraine's entry into NATO. It's just not perfectly designed. NATO is not perfectly designed for this situation. A country that's sort of in the midst of a war, you know, large population, important strategic geography. I mean, how do you do that? How do you bring a country like that into NATO? And Georgia faces a similar difficulty. And so I think our thinking then was too zero sum. We inherited that zero sum thinking from the 1990s, and we were never imaginative enough, imaginative enough to come up with something new. And so it's as if we're always applying this old architecture to a new landscape, uh, and it never fully fits. Uh, and I think when we have the conversation that's going to come this summer about the NATO summit in Washington, we're going to go around the same merry-go-round that we went around last summer. Uh, in Vilnius, where Ukraine will come very close to seeming to get an offer, and there'll be lots of goodwill and lots of speeches, and it's still not going to be there. But in a sense, it's still that that, that old architecture that's not going to uh, be sort of effectively or creatively applied uh, to Ukraine. So 
it's a new world. I do stand by the point that other structures will be developed, and that Ukraine will find its path into the West and it will uh, integrate. But I think we still labor under this uh, under this uh, this sort of zero sum. Uh, inherited. So there, my thinking hasn't changed too much, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's 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 the continuity that uh, that matters. Where my thinking has changed most, uh, I had been on the other side of these debates before 2022, and it felt that yes, a lot of what Russia had done in Ukraine was, you know, bad to unacceptable. Certainly, annexation of Crimea and the presence of Russian soldiers. But if we weren't really able to get them out or to do much about it. Uh, we had to find some other way forward, uh, and it was better to have dialogue than uh, pure conflict uh, and tension. Uh, and if we were sort of flexible enough on our side, we could muddle through. That was my uh, my hope, or maybe I was more optimistic that we could do more than muddle through, but over time figure out ways to resolve whatever tensions there are between Russia and the West in a in a in a sort of peaceful manner. Um, what's changed uh, in in my view is just the radicalism of Putin's foreign policy. That to me has made a huge impression. Uh, I don't think that that can be traced causally to the zero sum architecture problem that we had. We contributed to that environment in some ways. We sort of narrowed uh, the options, but the 2022 invasion of Putin is really on him. It's his decision. Most members, as I understand it, of the Russian national security elite did not want this invasion. The population of Russia was not pushing for this. Uh, invasion. It was not something that Putin had to do. He was not you know, the most cliched image of Putin, right? The boy or the teenager or the little kid with the rat is you know, cornered by the rat and has to lash out. Uh, the you know the sort of cheapest psychological explanation for that man's career. I don't think that applies. Uh, in 2022, there was no rat. Uh, he was not cornered. Uh, he made a very conscious decision, uh, and he did so uh, with the intent to eviscerate, at the very least, Ukrainian statehood and perhaps Ukrainian nationhood uh, as well. I don't think he's given up on those uh, ambitions and they just seem enormously far reaching and radical. You know, where the US falls on its policies, we can sort of leave for another question or sort of another moment, but that's almost <laughs> revolutionized my thinking about the country. I think I had fallen into a little bit of a trap speaking in somewhat more scholarly terms. I think Karen Delisha's book on Russian kleptocracy and Catherine Belton's book are strong well-researched books that tell us something about political economy in Russia, that it is kleptocratic. But I fell into the trap that believing that kleptocracy was a great explanation for how this country works, and it may be on certain levels, surely it is on certain economic levels. This is not a kleptocrat's war. If you're a kleptocrat, if you're there to steal and have a huge place in Sochi uh, and drink wine and spend time with your grandchildren, you don't need a big war like this. Uh, that's, that's, that's not an explanation. It's not uh, sort of helpful. So I'm trying to rethink and try to figure out without being too linear about where that radicalism comes from. In other words, not reading everything back in the light of this radicalism, but at least coming up with a paradigm uh, that is is more explanatory than the one that I had on uh, on the eve of the invasion. And I'm still <laughs> sort of struggling on that point. I'm awaiting the other books that are going to be written that help us to figure out this problem. Okay, uh, let me just take a question from the uh, virtual audience. Jack Jarman asks, the U.S. and Germany have been accused of slack mode compared to Poland, U.K., Denmark, Sweden, etc. The conditions they have placed on Ukraine and delay of arms delivery have caused them to be accused of denying the Ukrainians of, of a counteroffensive. Do you believe there may be elements within the Biden administration and Schultz's government who actually fear a Russian defeat because the political instability it might unleash would be difficult to control within and beyond the region? This is an important question. And I think on this, we have fortunately more evidence than on the question of why or sort of when Putin made the decision to uh, to invade. Um, I don't think, to try to be as precise as possible, that there's anybody in the Biden administration that feared point blank a Russian defeat. I think. Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, Bill Burns, Biden himself, and so seem to me the sort of four major decision makers are perfectly happy with Russia's defeat uh, in Ukraine. In a sense, that's what they've been driving at. The phrase that you heard from the State Department early on in the conflict was Russia's strategic defeat, which is a, gives a little bit of wiggle room. You know, maybe this some soldiers would stay, but Russia would be kind of uh, in a dead end. And I, and I would sort of take that more or less at that face value. That that's the that, that's what they were driving at. They had to to wrestle with two 
problem. I'm going to speak just about the U.S. and Germany can speak to it in a, in, a, in a moment, but they had to wrestle with two problems. One, <laughs> domestic politics. There is such a thing, uh, and it's a huge constraint uh, on, <laughs> on decision makers. Uh, you do have to get the money from Congress, as we've sort of learned uh, uh, maybe painfully in the last couple of months, but that's not something that the Biden administration could just override. So there were negotiations that had to be made, uh, and it's not as if everybody in the American body politic is in favor of a full speed, full court war. So domestic politics is a real consideration uh, and one that they had to uh, contend with. It's sort of focus on the figure of Bernie Sanders. He supports the war in Ukraine. He's an important senator, but it's not, you know, without limits. Uh, and there, there is probably a threshold with Bernie Sanders beyond which you would go, and you might lose the support. You start to lose the support of Democrats in the Senate, your policy might begin to uh, unravel. So they had to think that through, and that, I think, imposed certain limitations. The other point is not about Russia's defeat. What they worried about, and I'm glad that they did, is escalation. I think they probably got it wrong. We can say that now with the clarity of hindsight, that they were a little bit too shy or too scared about escalation. Maybe that's true. <laughs> Again, we don't really know that point, but that was very much on their mind. And that really takes us back to the fall of 2022, when you have a lot of loose rhetoric coming from Moscow about nuclear escalation and, and all of this. Maybe that was a bluff. 99% <laughs> chance it's a bluff, 1% chance it's not a bluff. If you're Jake Sullivan, that 1% is still going to be uh, pretty... Uh, pretty salient. So it doesn't let them off the hook. I think they made a lot of mistakes in this regard, uh, and it went much too slowly. Uh, and that uh, has caused all kinds of problems. But uh, I have some empathy for uh, the reasoning behind it. And I think it's not, uh, it's not what the questioner was implying, but it's not, you know, sort of cowardice uh, or, uh, or sort of weakness vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Germany has been more perplexing. Uh, it's sort of back in the role. Yashka Fischer had not been convinced by Donald Rumsfeld in the Munich Security Conference. And was, was going to be independent from the U.S. And, and, and Germany didn't follow down the path of the Iraq war. Uh, and now Germany has sort of by choice put itself in a very subservient role. Whatever the U.S. does, Germany will do, but it's not going to, uh, you know, sort of go a step ahead. Uh, and, you know, Germany has just showed relatively little leadership in this regard. And probably this is about questions related not so much to the Taurus missile, which is the big question often with Germany, but sort of shell production industrial capacity and those kinds of things. It's just baffling when you think of how close this war is to Germany, how much it's going to matter to Germany, and the fact that, as we all know, Ukraine could lose the war this year. That's not science fiction. That's not pure speculation. That Germany wouldn't be in a state of just greater urgency is hard to understand. But again, I think it's not so much out of fear that Russia's going to uh, going to win or fear that Russia's going to lose. It's it's sort of internal factors and, and maybe to a degree the personality uh, of, uh, of Schwartz. So maybe... Uh, too much empathy there uh, and too little criticism, but but but, uh, but that's what I'd say. Yes. Well, my name is Conrad. I'm a graduate student from Canada, Russian University. My question is, if the Western financial sanctions deployed in 2022 against Russia were deployed in 2014, when Russia was not as self-sufficient, would they cause the Russian economy to collapse? Okay. That's a really good um an interesting uh question goes back in some ways perhaps to the question of timing for putin and why he waited to do the very big invasion uh, certainly what you see if you think of this from a russian point of view in 2014 is that putin is pretty nervous about everything he's doing in 20 you can feel it in his body language and the way that he said things I think he was very nervous about the annexation of crimea uh, even when he makes that kind of propagandistic documentary he sort of he breathes a sigh of relief when he says that the u.s didn't really respond you know, sort of militarily to the to the annexation of, of, of Crimea. Uh, and I'm sure you're right that in 2014, a, a very high level of sanctions uh, could potentially have been uh, devastating. But um, uh, maybe this is very much a historian's response. The kinds of sanctions that were mustered were on the sort of outer perimeter of what domestic politics uh, would allow. Uh, on the European side, Europe does not sanction Russia until MH17. Uh, which is to say until the summer of 2014. So the annexation of Crimea goes unsanctioned uh, by uh, Europe. And I I don't quite remember what the limitations were uh, in terms of sanctioning Russia, but um, it was felt to be a very high level of sanctions in 2014, as if one were somehow going out uh, on a limb uh, and uh, you know almost experimental uh, in that regard. And there really wasn't will, any political will to go further. And on that question, uh, it's not as if President Obama was getting any pressure or much pressure from at least the Western Europeans uh, 
uh, to, to go further. So it's an interesting thought experiment, uh, but it's very hard for me to imagine the policy being anything than what it was uh, at, the, uh, at the time. Yes, Emma. Hi, um, I'm Emma Taylor. I'm a postdoctoral research scholar in the Ukrainian study of Um, I, I think anybody who's at least reasonably well informed would not disagree with you that there are very more geopolitical elements to, to what is happening. But at the same time, the genocidal nature of some of Russia's rhetoric towards Ukraine and the ways in which war crimes have been perpetrated against Ukrainians would look like there's something going on here. You know, more than NATO, more than connections with the US and Russia. So I'm just, I haven't read your book yet, unfortunately, but I'm just wondering how you see that kind of like fitting into this puzzle that you put. I think you were kind of starting to get into that in your response to the questions covered before, but I think it's kind of happy with what that would be great. Yes, um, that's um, uh, a sort of a crucial question not to get too caught up in geopolitics, which explain much of the world, but uh, are not a key. Uh, not always a key explanation and, and sort of have its have its limits. So we could go through all of the strategic reasons why Putin does what he does. And there are strategic reasons. It's not you know, a purely capricious choice uh, on his part. Uh, and uh, it's self-evident that geopolitics matters a lot to, uh, to the Kremlin. It does think in geopolitical terms about the U.S., about Europe uh, and, uh, and about Ukraine. And we could take that to the present moment in terms of decision making and try to understand the tenacity uh, of uh, Russia's will and sort of continuing this war and what might be the geopolitical or rather geopolitical uh, reasons for that. Uh, let me try to break your question into, into two parts. Um, when it comes to Putin himself, I struggle on this issue because I don't feel like I know enough about him. I don't know Putin's relationship to Ukraine when he was a child uh, and young adult. I don't think that he served there uh, at any point in his uh, in his career. Uh, obviously, we know sort of Putin in Germany, uh, and we get some sense of Putin and post-Soviet Russia in the 1990s from his vantage point. Uh, in St. Petersburg, we have the kind of bureaucratic Putin. Uh, and then, you know, 2011, 2012, we start to get this more reactionary figure who's drawing more on history and culture and religion, often in ways that are very dark uh, in relation to uh, to Ukraine. Uh, all I can do when it comes to Putin, again, very much guessing, uh, is uh, that there is a sense of entitlement that he has drawn from his reading of Russian history, uh, sort of entitlement to rule, uh, to have dominion over Ukraine, uh, which is in and of itself a very dark thing, that sort of entitlement. And what can be justified in the name of that entitlement is, is, is a lot. Uh, and whether that's fascistic or not, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's not the perfect word, uh, but still, let's just leave it at that, sort of dominion. There's something else at work in Putin, uh, which I think one would have to turn to the psychologist to explain, which is sort of a Cain and Abel uh, dynamic, as if Ukraine, Ukraine is, Ukrainians are my brothers, and yet they've sort of betrayed me by drawing close to the West. And so I am going to respond to that with, with violence. I'm responding to my brother with violence because he does have that rhetoric of brotherhood, the one people uh, motif. And there I know too little about other similar conflicts uh, where the rhetoric of brotherhood is used to justify violence. I don't know, genocidal violence. I, I, I'm not sure I would go quite that far in terms of uh, in terms of the adjective, but let's just compromise on extreme forms of, uh, of violence. Obviously the targeting of civilians, uh, abduction of children, you know, the extensive war crimes that have been documented by uh, by many journalists in terms of what Russia has done and, and, and continues to do uh, in Ukraine. But that justified by brotherhood, uh, that sort of violence uh, is psychologically, I find difficult to understand. Uh, but I, I sort of recognize it as there and part of the mix. So the entitlement to dominion and a kind of enraged sense of, of, of brotherhood is as best as I can do in terms of understanding uh, Putin himself and his will to inflict the kind of violence that he's daily inflicting on Ukraine. Now, the second and probably bigger and maybe even harder question is Russian support for the war. How much do they know about these war crimes? Certainly something, right? News trickles in. So many people have relatives. You can't, in the information age, sort of keep out the images if you're curious. But obviously the Russian media landscape is going to keep a lot of that 
uh, at bay. And so I think a lot of Russians dismiss these sort of accusations as 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 untrue, impossible, uh, false. So does that mean that Russians are justifying the violence that's being committed in their name? Obviously, the soldiers are sort of uh, doing it. Uh, I don't know how it feels at the moment uh, in uh, in Russia in that regard. Um, and uh, you know, all one can say from an from the outside is it looks like it's a relatively popular war. Now, whether that's because it's understood as self defense or this is what you have to do against the Americans or against the Europeans, or if it's like Putin, the Ukrainians have betrayed us and, and, and should be punished uh, as such. Again, I don't I don't quite know. I would I would want to need I would need to read more and sort of learn more uh, about that. But uh, your question, I think, takes us to the mind of Putin. And then secondly, to the popularity of the war in Russia. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I I wish I knew more about what justified all this on the Russian side or what is put forward as justification for this. Yes. Hello, I'm Paul Fiumilla, I teach in the history department here at Columbia. And when I teach classes on the Cold War, uh, I also make a case to my students that it was probably a mistake uh, for the United States to try to deny the Soviet Union a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe at the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, it wasn't it wasn't workable, it was problematic for all sorts of reasons. But then when I jump ahead to the present day, I'm horrified by the war of Ukraine, deeply critical of, of Russian policy. And but there's this this historian's voice inside my head that keeps saying, well, you know, wait a minute, we're, we're kind of doing the same thing in that we're trying to deny Russia a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. So I guess my question is, you know, is are we in a fundamentally different situation today in the 21st century versus the 20th century? Like, how should we think about this? I guess ultimately, what should I tell the students? <laughs> Just, Well, I think I'm a bit more, um, a bit less interesting than you as a, as a historian of the uh, of the Cold War, and sort of a bit more accepting. Maybe it's my State Department background, a bit more accepting of sort of what the U.S. government uh, was uh, uh, was aiming at. I mean, in a way, the U.S. did accept the Soviet sphere of influence over the Warsaw Pact countries. I guess it wasn't in a position uh, to contest, um, but where. The U.S. sort of held the line, and this is, I think, very relevant for present-day debates. Was the Iron Curtain and the containment of Soviet power beyond uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, and that to me seems like a very reasonable thing to have done uh, at the time, uh, for the sake of the people who are living there, the sort of larger European uh, order. But it, of course, it came with an enormous price, which was a very entrenched. Uh, enmity between the United States and the Soviet Union that really had its worst iterations outside of Europe and sort of all across the globe uh, in the fanaticism with which both the Soviet Union and the U.S. sort of waged the broader global Cold War. There are a lot more reservations for me come to mind, and I think the U.S. was much more prone to error and misjudgment, uh, you know, sort of overreach, uh, but I don't particularly mind the denial of the Soviet Union any more of a sphere of influence than it had uh, circa 1946 uh, or 19. Uh, 47. Um, going up to the present moment, I think that this is um, a very useful piece of history for present day uh, policymakers. It's sort of useful to be reminded that where the conflict is happening now, it sort of happened before. And that should alert us to the depth uh, of these collisions, that these are not temporary collisions, these are not superficial collisions, they're something, these have a real historical pedigree. Uh, and that to me is actually more ominous than anything else, because it shows how difficult these problems are going to be uh, to, uh, to solve. I think the denial of a Russian sphere of influence, um, which would be hotly debated among, of course, the uh, the various camps and, 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 and tribes of the of the Russia walkers, but the denial of a Russian sphere of influence, let's say in the Baltic Republics, you know, Sweden, Finland have sort of preemptively denied Russia the sphere of influence by uh, joining NATO, the kind of existing NATO commitments, I think they look pretty good in light of this awful war, that this is sort of a worthwhile thing to, to do, and the alternative is probably uh, quite uh, problematical, then there's all the kind of zero-sum ba baggage of uh, of the early period, which, uh, which complicates that. I think that where we can learn from the past is maybe in the following way, that if you try to deny Russia these spheres of influence, there's going to be conflict and probably war. 
That's that's you know, the outcome of that policy. So if you commit yourself to that for moral reasons, for geopolitical reasons, for political reasons, uh, you have to accept that there's going to be a high degree of conflict with Russia. And then the larger question becomes, can you find certain rules of engagement within that conflict? And I think there, actually, to me, the Cold War offers a number of fairly instructive examples that it was possible to avoid nuclear escalation of the Cold War. It was possible to avoid some of the worst forms of escalation. Uh, and perhaps we could learn from that uh, in the present moment. But uh, it comes to see, comes to feel to me, I sort of mentioned this in the conclusion to the book, that it's a totally insoluble problem. The insoluble problem is where does Europe end and where does Russia begin? And the equally insoluble problem is where does Russia end and where does Europe begin? You know, that's um, a 70, 80 or, you know, 100 year old uh, problem. And I've become very pessimistic about the prospects of, uh, of, of solving it. Can I um, speak on this? I, I mean, maybe, but another way to think about it wouldn't wouldn't be a different a different kind of narrative. Like, well, what we're witnessing is the collapse of the Soviet Union, and so if we just accept the boundaries that the Soviet Union itself drew um, around its Union republics or its internal republics, and accept that those states that formed in 1991 should be sovereign, then we could think about you know this is the final death throes of the Soviet Union and we can accept these new borders as sovereign states that should have the right to self-determination. So uh, I'm not sure if um, this, this kind of idea of, of, uh, uh, of um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of tension between this, the world the way it is today, where there are nation states that have sovereignty and this idea of, of spheres of influence, which is you know directly um, contravenes the idea of nation states. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask why we haven't sort of repeated or think about why we haven't, or why the US politicians haven't kind of framed this conflict in these terms. Like why not, you know, when, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the US president talked endlessly about the violation of state sovereignty and the US having to come to the aid of small defenseless states mm -hmm. living in the shadow of large states. Well, it seems to me that Ukraine regardless of all of the arguments that Putin makes about history and all of the discussion of nations and the national histories, which is admittedly complex, it's a sovereign state. So it's not too complex to understand that large regional powers should not invade small regional powers. And yet nobody really talks about it in these terms. Uh, and it avoids all of these complex arguments about the long, deep history of who has the right to what. I mean, 1991, sovereign state, the world accepted as an independent state, a larger power comes along and invades and tries to remove its sovereignty. Why is that open to question or debate? So I'm not sure what you think about the competing narratives, like you know, sure. democracy, the spread of Russia, Russia's imperialist going to take over Europe, all of these ideas. But what about just you know that the world should respond, and not just the U.S., to the idea that large powers shouldn't invade small powers and and destroy them and kill their populations and reduce them to ashes? Um, and I. I I don't know what you think about how Europe understands it, but it seems to me Europe should be deeply invested also in that that kind of fear of large regional powers given its its history during the 20th century. Yeah, no, I think that the, the normative case is unimpeachable. Uh, it's absolutely true that the best Europe is going to be based on sovereignty and independence of nation states, big and small, you know, strong and weak, whatever that might mean. That's the best of the vision that Europeans can have for Europe and that the U.S., going back to Woodrow Wilson, has had for uh, Europe. Uh, and that, of course, applies directly to the war in Ukraine. But norms are only as good as they're enforceable. So it's it's one thing to articulate these norms. Uh, they're very beautiful norms, but they're unbelievably difficult to enforce. So what about the sovereignty of Belarus? Is that a sovereign country? I, I wouldn't describe it as such. It seems to me sort of like a colony of uh, of Russia's that goes against everything most Europeans would want to believe about Europe and probably what many Belarusians would want to believe about Belarus. But there it is. Uh, and what's one to do about that? Um, wage war uh, against Russia for the sake of Belarusian sovereignty. I think that that's off the table. So if that's off the table, in a sense, what do we do? And I think that in my reading of it, at least certainly that's very much the reason why European countries and the U.S. Is supporting Ukraine at the present moment is precisely because of the importance of its sovereignty and territorial independence, that for Ukraine in and of itself, uh, and then going back to the question about war crimes and the humanitarian implications of that, but Ukraine, this is clear about the war in Ukraine, it's going to be a precedent-setting war. 
much as the Second World War was and the First World War was. It's going to set the precedent for the next few decades of European life. Mm -hmm. And so if sovereignty is eviscerated in Ukraine, that will be the precedent set. And if sovereignty is defended and, and, uh, and achieved, that will be the precedent set. So those are the stakes. But still, you know, the U.S. can't make up its mind about supporting Ukraine militarily at the present moment. Uh, that's a big practical problem. And that's starting to be felt. You know, the interceptors are not going. The air defenses are getting degraded. Russia is making more and more attacks on the civilian infrastructure uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. And that's kind of the reality of things. And so the reality is going in its own direction. Uh, and the normative uh, visions are uh, are there. They're, they're mobilizing. They're motivating. Uh, they've legitimated two and a half years of very fervent support for Ukraine. So it's not to say that the story uh, is one of defeat. Uh, but uh, it's really touch and go at the moment with this war. Uh, and, you know, to to defend Ukraine's sovereignty, you need to have all the practical military tools necessary uh, to defend it. And that's just an immense project. So the question is sort of, are we up to the task? But as for the articulation of the ideals, I don't feel like there's too much of a problem. I think that that's what you get from Brussels and Berlin and Paris, uh, London and Washington insofar as it concerns uh, the White House. The ideas are articulated, but you know, is the is is the ability there to back them up. Yes. When Russia got invaded without its current military edge from hypersonic missiles. I ask this because Brzezinski in his book, It was Soviet Contest, published in 1986, one of the scenarios was the Soviets going into Western Europe, but only if they felt assured of the outcome of the absent kind of it's a bit beyond my capacity uh, in uh, in this regard. Um, you know, I think Putin probably reviewed the full repertoire of uh, of Russian military and economic assets, from nuclear weapons to tanks, ammunition, etc., uh, and made his decision on that uh, basis. But I doubt that it was any one set of of, of weapons that was uh, that was uh, that was decisive. Um, in some ways, it's been. Uh, the most avant-garde of wars in terms of drone warfare uh, and technologies. And in some ways it's been, you know, a kind of World War One time mm -hmm. type conflict as we've noted a couple of times this uh, this afternoon, which is to say trenches and, and tanks and, and, uh, and ammunition. So sort of low tech and high tech simultaneously. So I, I wouldn't focus in on any one, uh, any, any one particular weapon. Ferenc, also I'm a visiting professor here at the Ariman. I understand you finished the book before the huge escalation of the conflict in the Middle East. So I was wondering if it has changed your understanding of what's actually going on. I think there are two notable points um, when it comes to the, to the Middle East that follow from the kind of global instability I was hoping to chart in this uh, in this book. And one is going back Keith, to your question about Russia's radicalism. Russia's radicalism is not something that only concerns Ukraine. Uh, you know, Russia has a fairly radical foreign policy across the board, and some of that is its strategic vision, but some of it is just the dependencies that are building up on the Russian side. So there are two countries in the world that are overtly giving arms to Russia, uh, and that's North Korea and Iran, each of which have ambitious, ambitious regional uh, agendas. And the fact that Russia is becoming, you know, by the month, more dependent on these two countries, is something that serves to embolden both countries or may serve to embolden both countries. I don't think we've seen that full bore yet with North Korea, but it could come to uh, pass, but certainly with Iran. Uh, and it would be simplistic to say that, you know, from Moscow to Tehran to Hamas to October 7th, it's not, that's not the uh, the chain. And yet I wonder if Iran, which had to green light that operation in some way uh, on October 7th, if it would have had the, the will to do that if it didn't have the sense that there's a kind of new Russian backstop uh, and a new relationship that it has with Russia. And we see, of course, in Russia's response to October 7th, that it sort of put all of its eggs now in the Hamas basket, and, you know, ruined its relationship to Israel, tried to use the kind of media payoff for that, uh, you know, sort of global political payoff to that as much as possible. And that just bespeaks, again, this kind of new uh, radicalism. Uh, and that's important for understanding the overall dynamic in the Middle East, the kind of role that Russia is playing. Prior to that, of course, you had the Russian movement to Syria, but at least with the Arab-Israeli conflict, what Russia was was sort of a hedging power. So they would talk to the Palestinian Authority, they would talk to Hamas, they would talk to Israel, and they sort of sounded like, well, we want to resolve the conflict because we talk to everybody, and you Americans just talk to the uh, 
uh, to the Israelis. That is gone. That's over. Uh, and the cost of Russia is genuinely uh, more radical in the region with consequence. Secondly, and I think we need to, again, the cognitive shift here is, is, is for me sort of a work in progress as with the notion of Europe as at war, but there's no collective problem solving that's going to happen between the US and Russia or the West and Russia. It's just not going to, it's not going to happen. Russia doesn't compartmentalize anymore. The days when you could sort of have JCPOA, but still sanction Russia because of Crimea or have conflict with Russia and Ukraine, but uh, engage in some of these other issues, those days are gone. Uh, and there's just no way that Russia is going to approach this conflict and say, what can we achieve with the United States to wind back the tension in the Middle East? That's a theoretical possibility. Uh, Russia's going in exactly the opposite direction. There's no way that U.S.-China tension, Russia is going to sort of insert itself as a power that could resolve or, or, or limit that tension or sort of uh, conciliate there. It's just not uh, what's going to happen. Russia is going to do what it feels it needs to do to prolong the war and to encourage an American defeat in Europe, whether that's in Latin America with whatever tools it has there or the Middle East uh, or Asia. And that's the world that we're now living in. <laughs> so uh, uh, great power, radical great power, non-cooperation. And so I think the Middle East needs to be understood in part uh, through that lens and, and in sort of other regions uh, as well. And that's a big shift from where we were even 10 years ago. Tito, do you wanna make a comment yeah, on this? To build on that, that's a great question. Um, this shift, particularly on Gaza, switch from Israel is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck if you had a reaction to Putin's comment in light of the attack on the Crocus concert. I, I, I was yeah. a little surprised to hear him seem perplexed that somehow we're the good guys. We're, we're implicitly working with Hamas, with, with the good guys in this war against Israel. And I'm, and I'm thinking, do you not know what you've been doing in Syria the last 12 or 13 years? Why maybe there's some radical Muslims who may not like you. I, I just did you have a reaction to his comment on this? I'll offer a more superficial reaction. It seemed uh, I just was thinking it was thinking of domestic Russian politics. It seemed really clumsy, and that's maybe where the recipe of blame Ukraine for everything well, yes. will have its will have its limits. The population is to a degree in lockstep with the Kremlin on some of these issues, perhaps out of sincere conviction, perhaps out of coercion. Here it just seemed like you know uh, it was too fast of a response from the Kremlin, and it was not. Um, you know, it's not Putin sort of masterfully, you know, ruling the situation and ruling the narrative. He seemed to be sort of behind the curve and, um, you know, pretty obviously covering up for ineptitude and, and yeah. failure to predict and, and and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's uh, always useful when you have a uh, an occasion to sort of bring Putin back down to size and not make him larger than he is. And, and Crocus seems like one of those occasions. But And I think the Crocus attack also shows, makes your point that you were just making prior to Peter's question that Russia is now just all in and so focused on the war, they wouldn't even listen to the warnings by the US that there's going to be a major sure. terrorist attack. There's like no kind of bilateral cooperation that used to exist even at the le level of terrorism in the past. Yes. In October, a large number Could of- Could you introduce of, yourself? Sorry. Well, part of me. My name is Theo Lipsky. I'm a graduate student here at CEDAR in the International Security Policy Council. Uh, in October, uh, a large number of Republican congressmen and senators co-signed a letter that framed their opposition to further aid to Ukraine in terms of uh, their belief that the present administration lacked a coherent and stated strategy uh, behind which uh, they could get. I know that you've since gone on the record in foreign affairs outlining a strategy that the United States might adopt that uses the language of containment. It, were you to say make that case to J.D. Vance and his staff who tend to lead this line of argument, granting that, let's just say for this question that they're doing so in good faith and sure. rather than as a cynical political move on behalf of candidate Trump, as you mentioned earlier, uh, how would you frame that case, given perhaps their skepticism that the international order which America would defend is, not, in their view, not a good thing? Sure, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. Was it Professor Chamberlain who was asking about the the, the Cold War? I think these are uh, interrelated questions uh, in some ways. Uh, it's the least creative idea possible for a scholar of the Cold War to suggest that containment should be the policy of the U.S. government uh, at the present moment. But having worked in the U.S. government for two years, I don't think creativity is 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 always the is always the necessity. Sometimes old ideas are uh, are good ideas. I think that that's true. 
uh, in this uh, in this case. So containment can have uh, a variety of different meanings, and I think we can sort of take it to an imaginary JD band staffer in a moment. Uh, but there's the more hawkish component to containment, which to me would suggest in Ukraine that you want to hold the line as much as possible. That the ideal for the U.S. as it would be for Ukraine is to further to be no line at all, it would be to eliminate the Russian military presence in Ukraine uh, and to make Ukraine so well defended that Russia would not be able to, you know, menace uh, Ukrainian civilians. That would be sort of the maximum degree uh, of containment, if logistically possible. But containment could also be less than that, uh, and you know, sort of trying to prevent uh, the Russian army from moving further into Ukraine or pushing back to the extent that you can. That's a military proposition and that's you sort of on the hawkish side of things. So that would have to be sincerely explained uh, to the JD Band staffers and they probably would be a little bit reluctant to take that in. Uh, but there are other aspects of containment that might be a little bit more encouraging to them, you know, Kennan having, you know, some kind of realist roots uh, in the 1940s uh, and also in a certain way, some conservative roots, a Midwesterner, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from Wisconsin, uh, who is certainly aware of the kind of so-called isolationist tradition uh, in American foreign policy. And these would be uh, as follows, that containment is not a theory of victory. Uh, and it's anything but marching to Moscow. Uh, it is a theory that is used in the nuclear age because you don't presume the unconditional surrender of your opponent. And so it's not overreach. It's not excess. We're not talking about, you know, sort of a massive World War III type commitment here is something much more delimited uh, and there are constraints uh, and there are sort of borders beyond which you're not gonna uh, not gonna go uh, and uh, you know sort of uh, emphasizing that point I think would be uh, would be important uh, and also that containment uh, is uh, a sort of political a political notion as well that it's about setting the example uh, and hoping that by setting the example you can kind of set certain good things uh, into motion. Uh, you know, let's make America into a city on a hill, Senator Vance, uh, and that too will be containment in addition to, you know, holding the line, you know, sort of militarily and not escalating in a way that would be dangerous for the United States. Now, it's not quite where Elbridge Colby is. He's sort of the presumed Secretary of State in the Trump administration. He has a more zero-sum attitude, which is not quite, I think, where J.D. Vance is, or maybe it is, but it's sort of everything we give to Ukraine is what we're not giving to a potential conflict with China. So you need to kind of sort of rewind and sort of recalibrate. Their containment is not going to uh, is sort of not going to get you that far, but you have to make the case for the importance of Europe and for you know sort of peace and security in Europe to uh, to redirect that point. But it's 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 a very very useful thing to be thinking of. But to me, a sort of additional appeal of containment is that it can cross the aisle and kind of get moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans to to, to back it. Hey, Barbara. Um, I'm also a great policy student here at CIPA. Um, let you go back to the question about the Middle East and policy maybe a little differently. Um, I'd be interested in your view, but you think that the US policy on Gaza sort of undermines internal, maybe even the external coherency of US foreign policy, especially on. Okay, well, I, I sort of hope that this is not the last question because I feel like I'm going to give a somewhat Machiavellian answer to it. And, uh, you know, um, well, if, 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 if it's necessary to end on a Machiavellian note, then we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll end on a, Machia, uh, a, 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 Machiavellian, a Machiavellian note. It's a crucial question, a crucially important uh, question. Certainly um, in the political domain, uh, the U.S. has done a lot of damage uh, to his cause and, you know, sort of Germany along uh, with it and, and a number of European countries. I think in the following way, I mean, we could parse the details, but I think in the following way, creating the perception without the government's desiring to do this, but creating the perception that loss of civilian life means one thing in Ukraine, and it means something very different in Gaza. So loss of civilian life is going to be responded to with Ukrainian flags and military assistance uh, and rhetoric and speeches, uh, whereas loss of civilian life in Gaza is sort of an opportunity cost to the war or a second tier news story. Uh, or something that's not that significant. So my former boss at the State Department, John Feiner, had to give an off-the-record speech uh, in Michigan. He's the Deputy National Security Advisor, and he acknowledged there a kind of lack of sensitivity on the part of the Biden administration to the suffering of the civilians of, uh, of Gaza. So is that 100% correct reading of Western policy? You put that question to the side. 
the perception is absolutely there uh, and it's very, very uh, damaging. Uh, I have, you know, sort of no doubt about, uh, no doubt about that. The reason I think a Machiavellian answer can still be given by Machiavellian sort of, forgive me, I'm going back to geopolitics and, uh, and to this, you know, sort of uh, level of, uh, uh, level of analysis, those countries that have been most angered by the U.S. response to Gaza were not on board with U.S. policy toward Ukraine to begin with. So it's not as if any big country has been lost. I mean, India is sort of an interesting case, um, uh, a, a little bit exceptional maybe in terms of its attitude toward these two conflicts uh, simultaneously. But it's not as if, you know, Canada was very supportive of Ukraine and then October 7th came, saw the U.S. response and Canada have, has withdrawn support from uh, for Ukraine is just not how it's worked. So the countries that were on board before October 7th are still on board, and the countries that were not on board before October 7th, sometimes, you know, sort of absurdly referred to uh, as the Global South, uh, you know, they're sort of uh, also haven't really changed uh, their calculus. So if we're here to discuss US policy toward Ukraine, uh, I don't think it's changed uh, enormously. And the second Machiavellian answer that can be given is that what would really affect U.S. policy toward Ukraine would be a wider regional war. So a sort of a israel Hezbollah war or an Israel-Iran war, which could still, of course, happen, right? You had the Israeli strikes on, uh, on uh, sort of Iranian figures a, a few weeks ago, and it's not as if the northern border of Israel is in any sense peaceful. If you have a larger war in the Middle East, then the U.S. is going to have to go into all kinds of trade-off questions about where to allocate military resources and where to allocate... Uh, economic resources. And in that sense, you could see, so see a major shift uh, in policy or policy outcomes. Here, it's the moral story of politics, which is highly significant. It's the political story uh, that's highly significant. But in practical terms, I don't think October 7th has made too much of a dent uh, in terms of U.S. policy or in terms of the coalition that's supporting uh, that's supporting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jeff, you have Final questions. I have a question, just so that you don't have to end up. <laughs> I, I have a question about Ukraine and Europe, but if anyone has another question, then we can. Okay, then I will. I just want to ask you to expound, expand a little bit on what you mentioned earlier at the beginning of your talk on how Ukraine might engage with Europe or become more European without entering um, necessarily NATO or EU. Um, you mentioned. Um, movement of peoples and and i just uh you were a little bit cryptic about some of the other ideas you had but i'm very interested in uh ukraine's european turn and the sense of itself as you as european so i wanted to hear what you have to say about that right well going back to the point of departure which i mentioned when speaking about the europe category here so the association agreement mm -hmm. with the european union that's actually signed back in in 2015. I always wonder what it looked like to Yanukovych in, in sitting wherever he sits in uh, in Russia when he saw that uh, when he saw that moment, sort of his undoing, um, uh, you know, the thing that he couldn't navigate, sort of seeing how that uh, how that came uh, to pass. That was a, a step taken uh, long ago. Uh, I think what the European Union, I think there's sort of similar answers in both cases. What the European Union is going to have to do is to sort of come up with phases that are more than the association agreement, that are sort of more than that but maybe fall short for the time being of EU membership, because that's going to just take, uh, that's going to take time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll have spoilers within the European Union. I think we can sort of point our finger to Hungary and elsewhere where, where, where problems are going to arise in that regard. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that there's a lot of interim uh, arrangements, whether that's commercial and trade agreements, whether that's some of that, uh, I'm not up to speed on this issue at the moment, but sort of work visas and, and sort of work permits that allows people from Ukraine to go mm -hmm. uh, into the economies of the EU and, uh, you know, sort of to uh, to make money there. There are all kinds of institutions uh, that can be built up with European help uh, in Ukraine. I'm aware of the Wissenschaftliche mm -hmm. League in, in, in Berlin is going to build a set of offices in Kiev to sort of create a, uh, a an offshoot of the Wissenschaftliche League. Uh, in in Berlin, in in Ukraine, that's not a top down EU decision, but that's something that can be done that can link students, scholars, and and others uh, in Ukraine to the to the broader European world. And I think there are a million of those things that can be done mm -hmm. today. Uh, and maybe that's the road that you that you build or that you pave toward uh, toward EU membership. If we're very binary about it, you're either in or you're out. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm nervous. Uh, the less binary we are, the more 
gradations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, sort of the better off things will be. And the same with NATO, it's kind of you're in, you're out. Mm -hmm. So Biden has said uh, that he's not going to uh, welcome Ukraine into NATO until the war is over, which is, you can understand why he would say it. It's sort of a maddening statement, because if the war is over and you're able to bring Ukraine into NATO, then in a way the, the problem is over. So it's sort of, he's not going to solve the problem until the problem is uh, is no more, um, which um, has its convenience if you're a politician, but it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's sort of illogical. So I think there too, that there are lots of things that can be done that are not NATO membership per se that could matter. And so a lot of countries have already signed bilateral security agreements with yeah. Uh, with Ukraine, what could be done on the U.S. side if there would be the political will is that you do make a security agreement to a portion of Ukrainian territory that you're able to defend. That's not really something that NATO could very easily do, uh, but it is something that doable. People speak of the sort of South Korean model or the West German model to, you know, that states that are not uh, complete, uh, that have uh, alien elements sort of within them or on top of them, but nevertheless can be drawn into alliances and partnerships uh, and security arrangements. All of that seems uh, possible, you know, I don't know the logistics of it, but uh, it seems uh, possible. And again, there too, you kind of build the steps forward for large parts of Ukraine to gain a greater degree of security and a greater degree of outside commitment. And when that policy starts to succeed, then you can sort of expand the perimeter of that uh, of that commitment. But to be a little bit more ad, ad hoc, uh, a little bit more flexible, uh, and a little bit more creative. So Keith, I think we kind of end up back where we uh, began. The binary thinking of the 1990s has to perhaps be uh, overcome the sort of ancient security architecture from the 1940s is venerable and has its place, uh, but doesn't seem to be solving too many problems at the moment. So let's strike out in new ways uh, and come up with new ideas in this regard. There, Thank you. I think I feel like I've escaped Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of Thank cool. you. Or with John Locke, or you know, sort of a, a brighter mind. Yeah, uh, and and I think that's a little bit more of a hopeful note to end this really fascinating discussion. And I want to thank you for attending and thank you especially. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. a lot of territory. Keith, will you be in, in, in DC at all? Susan Baker, Peter, Susan Glass, and Peter Baker, for the growing up book and Dr. Masters. Yeah. Well, it's like a big, I mean, it's like a big Russia book, but part of it is sort of like Dr. Watchers.